Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to you all. I uh, hope that you've had an amazing week, a great Easter Sunday, and a great Easter Monday, and keeping well and staying well and being well this week. Uh, as we, uh, before we start with our main 10 a.m. service, I wanted to share something that I've been thinking about and I think that we all could definitely learn from. Uh, so I got three scriptures that I wanted to share with everyone this morning. And the first one that I wanted to share with you, and if you've got your iPads out or your Bibles or your, your phones or wherever your scriptures are, just, just follow along with me to Proverbs chapter 12, verses 25. And the scripture says in Proverbs 12, 25, Worry weighs a person down, and encouraging word cheers a person up. Worry weighs a person down, and encouraging word cheers a person up. Now I want us to move our scriptures to Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. We'll read it again. Isaiah 41.10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And finally, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Again, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. The scripture says, then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find the rest of your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now, you might see a little bit of a correlation between Proverbs 12, 25, Isaiah 41, 10, and Matthew 11, 28 to 30. You can probably guess what I want to talk about for the next 15 minutes. A few years ago, there was a speaker at our church, and um, they said something I will never forget, never, ever forget. Um, if you've been like me, you've grown up at church, you've heard a bunch of sermons, you've heard a bunch of messages, uh, you've seen a bunch of different people come and um, share the good news. Uh, but you're probably like me, and you can't recall everybody's sermon titles. Uh, you can't remember which person shared what. Uh, but there was this one speaker who came to our church who said something about the concept of worrying that I'll never forget. And if you haven't uh, been able to see the correlation, what I want to talk about is worrying. And um, this speaker said something about worrying that I can never forget. And this is what they said, and I'm going to paraphrase it. They asked, well, why do we worry all the time? Why do we care to worry all the time? Why does worrying take up most of our days? Why is worrying so important when science, data, and quantitative measures tell us that 80% of the stuff that we actually worry about will never happen? And that's what I will never forget, is that 80% of the stuff that we actually worry about does not happen. So I started asking myself, if more than half of the stuff that I worry about, if more than half of the stuff that keeps me up at night doesn't happen, then why does this horrible feeling take up most of my day? I started asking myself, if worrying was a professional sport, many of us, you and me probably, would be the most valuable player on our team. Can you identify with what I'm saying? It's so hard not to worry when trouble looms all around us. So I started looking in the dictionary for the, most, for the best definition of what the word worrying means. And the one that I'm going to refer to is um, the definition of to torment oneself with cares and anxieties. To torment oneself with cares and anxieties. So every time I worry, I torment myself. And what's interesting is no one is no one else is making us do it or doing to us. No one can make us worry. Instead, we're doing it to ourselves. No one is making us do it or doing it to us. Instead, we're doing it to ourselves. And I started thinking about it. When we worry, we allow our mindsets to dwell in the difficult circumstances, overwhelming fears and other stresses that are weighing us down. We're consumed over actual things we're facing or potential situations that may never occur 
80% of the stuff that I worry about does not happen, but I'm consumed over actual things I'm facing or potential situations that may never occur. And worry causes extreme distress in areas of our bodies. It prevents us from sleeping. Many of you can't even get a good night's sleep because of the worry that you go through. It impacts your relationships with your friends and your family and your loved ones. It affects your appetites. If you're like me, if you go through a season of worrying, you, you won't eat anything because you don't have an appetite. And it might even cause you to perform poorly at work where your mind is elsewhere, but you got projects to do or you got things to do and you can't even find um, the peace of mind to do your work correctly. And I did a quick Google search to understand the human brain. And I Google searched, what are the things we worry about? Now, I understand that this might not be on your list and every person is different, but I'm certain you and I have had some of the same worries that'll show up on this list. And here's what I found. Overwhelmingly, I Google searched about 15 or 20 different lists of what are the things we worry about. And these were our common denominators. The common denominators that I found were money and our finances, job security, relationships, and health. Money and our finances, job security, relationships, and our health. And I thought to myself, well, isn't it interesting that a time like right now that we're living in, these four worries that I've highlighted, money and our finances, job security, relationships, and health. Many of us who are sitting down with me this morning and listening, we're feeling it right now. There are some of us who are sitting down in our living rooms right now or in our bedrooms or our kitchens listening, who have been laid off. And we've lost hours at work, making it very hard to pay our bills, to pay our mortgage, to pay our line of credit, to take care of our families. Many of us have had to put our mortgage on pause, our car payments on pause, and we're worried about our money and our finances. And we're also worried about our job security. Some of us are working right now, but we're unsure if our job's gonna last. Many of us are thinking that every day we go to work or every day we might get an email or a phone call saying you've lost your job or we've laid off. Some of us, actually a lot of us have probably had a strain in our relationships because there is limited space and you're starting to get annoyed a little more quickly because you're always around your spouse or you're always around your partner or your children and you're not used to that. You're used to having your space or your nine to five and then you could come home and be with your family. But now that everybody might be in um, small quarters with one another, you might feel a little bit more agitated quickly. And then finally, your health. There's no, there's no aloe vera gel anywhere. There's no Purell for miles. Everybody is concerned about their health right now. And it's interesting because the common denominator of what people worry about, money and our finances, job security, relationships, and health. That's what many of us are worried about today. And we tend to worry about what matters the most to us. It is also the place, though, that I've realized that we tend to trust God the least. We worry about the stuff that matters, but it's also the place where we don't trust God. When we have an extra amount of pressure put on us, we're under stress. We worry about things when we're stressed about. Something we're facing at work or home with a friend or family member or a fear has overtaken us that we can't seem to overcome, it all affects us. And when we are stressed, we look for ways to deal with that stress. Some people choose denial. Some people choose drinking. Some people would rather do drugs. Some may choose to, to vent to other people. Some may choose to cheat on their partner. Many choose worrying as their coping mechanism. Imagine that worry is a fire. And the more we worry, and the more we allow worrying to occupy our thoughts, the more fuel we're putting on that worry fire. The more we do this, the bigger the fire we have to put out later. Most of our worry is directed towards things that might happen. But the truth is, is that if you're worrying about it, it's probably dictating your life and it does nothing but make your problem bigger. I can never imagine and I won't imagine how many of you are feeling this morning. 
Some of you might be doing amazing during this time and you've mastered your mental health and the space that you're living in and the space that you're working in. But many of us, we're uncomfortable. We're living in a moment of uncertainty and we can't help but think of the worst common denominator. The least we can do is remind ourselves that even though it seems uncertain, I can guarantee, if you have even just a little bit of a mustard seed of faith, that God will get me through it. Even if it seems impossible, a mustard seed of faith ought to tell us that God has a plan to get me through this. Matthew 6, 34 is a scripture that I would ask everyone to turn their, script, their Bibles to or to, to put their phones on and their iPads on it, because I think this is really important for us to remember. Matthew 6, 34 says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I read it again. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own set of problems, its own set of anxieties, its own set of worries and issues. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own problems. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, for many people I've asked, this can be something very comfortable. And for other people who have told me, this is very uncomfortable to hear. But it also raises the question, well, how do I apply this into my life today? How do I actually apply this, this verse? Don't worry about tomorrow. How do I apply that into my life today? Because worry can be such a joy stealer. It's a robber of peace. It, it steals my energy. It steals my time. And I want you to know something confidently. You don't need to know the future in order to stop worrying about it. And it's not because you're a genius and it's not because you're smarter than everyone. But I believe it's because you have this opportunity to know God and that God knows the future and that you can trust him with your future. My main hope for everyone today is to listen in on what God has to say. How do I apply this verse? Jesus tells us, don't worry about tomorrow, worry about today. How do I apply it? Well, in verse 33, we read Matthew 6, 34, which says, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will have its own problems. I want you to worry about today. How do I apply it? Well, it says in Matthew 6, 33, one scripture ahead of this, he gives us the prerequisite for living or trying to live a worry-free life. Christ says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. What he's saying in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33, what he's saying is that when you seek Christ and his kingdom and allow God to be the navigator of your life, and when you rely on grace of God through faith, your worries will tend to wash away because you have this mustard seed of faith that God will take responsibility for your future. Now that might seem like white roses and peach candy. Does that mean that worries will be gone? Absolutely not. We are told that troubles and worries are actually a part, are ingrained in this life. And I find that people who have this love of Christ and who have experienced the love of Christ and who believe in Christ, that sometimes we feel let more. The people that have a relationship with Christ, they tend to worry and feel it more because you believe and you know in Christ's goodness so much. Those individuals who really have this relationship with Christ, they tend to feel the pressure more. They feel it tenfold because they have this strong belief in the awesomeness of Christ. But when you prioritize a relationship, notice I did not say religion. I said relationship. 
when you prioritize a relationship with Christ, I actually believe God will readjust the desires of your life. And he'll do a great work inside of you. And he will help you clearly see the things in life that actually matter. Just like I said last week, through this time in quarantine and through this time of being working from home, I'm clearly seeing the idols that my heart has collected over these years. And this quarantine has actually helped me realize that we all deserve and need and require a better, stronger relationship with Christ. Not just an affiliation, not just a partnership, but an actual deep-rooted relationship. When you make this relationship the most important thing, temporary disappointments won't actually phase you. Why do I say that? It's because you'll never feel separated from the love that Christ has for his children. How many of us are sitting down and listening in your living rooms today, actually wanting to have that deeper relationship? And I can tell you, I know I still do, and I hope you do too. Think about those relationships that you have currently in your life or the relationships you've had in your past with, with who I'm talking about as your best friend. I want you to think about that person who has been with you through thick and thin, that individual we like to call our ride or die. That friend, that best friend in your life that no matter what time it is, whether it's 10 o'clock in the morning, 6 to, 6.30 in the evening, or 3.30 in the morning, if you call, they're going to pick up. That friend who was with you when your heart got broken. That friend who was with you uh, when you were really sick and that person was always there checking up on you and making sure you're okay. That friend who was with you, that person that you had called when you, and you got passed up for that job promotion and you felt like you were defeated, but that person had the right words to lift you up. Think about that friend that was with you maybe when you got a, a divorce or your heart was broken or you went through a bad relationship or you had problems in your family and, and they were with you through thick and thin. That one individual in your life who you can count on. And I ask you to now consider that person and what is that relationship built on? What is it rooted on? And I can guarantee you that person who you could call at 2.30 in the morning the reason why you have that relationship, the reason why you have that permission to call them at 2.30 in the morning is because you have a relationship with that person that is rooted in love and trust. True friendship has love and trust always at the core of it all. And then I started asking myself, isn't that what a relationship with Christ actually looked like? Love and trust in Christ, loving him and trusting him to be with you through thick and thin, through good times and bad, through despair and happiness. I started asking myself, well, isn't that what Christ wanted from all of us? To trust him as much, maybe even a little bit more than that friend that we can call at 2.30 in the morning. And then I had to check myself and remind myself that the people that I have in my life, it's because God actually brought them in my life and he wanted me to be in relationship with them. Let's remember that God also put Christ in the world so that I could also have a deeper relationship and the greatest friend of all. A friend that will cry with you, a friend that will comfort you and be with you and shield you and essentially die for you. When we rest in our relationship with Jesus, not when you rest in a religion, but when you rest in friendship with Christ, he'll make a way. The scripture says, cast all your burdens on him for he cares for you. And when he cares for you, your burden will become light. How many of us are sitting in our living rooms this morning wishing for our burdens to be light? I know I want them to be light. And I got to remind myself that it's on Jesus who cares for me so much that he will take the burdens off of me and carry them for me. Now, I know that my friends and my best friends and my partners will be there to listen to my burdens and comfort me temporarily. But will all of my friends, will all of my compadres, will all of my partners, will they carry my worries and burdens? Christ said he'll carry my burdens, but will my friends, the people who I can call at 2.30 in the morning, will they carry my cross? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But I know that there's no maybe when it comes to Christ and my relationship because he guarantees that he'll carry my burden, he'll carry my pain, he'll carry my worries. Why? It's because he loves us. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 6, it says that I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work 
until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I want to close with this. What if we don't worry at all? How much extra time in the day would we have to devote to things that are positive and actually make a difference? If we don't worry at all, how much time would I have back in my life to focus on the things that actually matter, make a positive influence in my community, make a positive impact on my family, to the things that actually made a difference? It, the return on investment would be unbelievable. You know, we all have a certain amount of mental and emotional energy each day. And should worry take up most of that energy? I don't think we should let worry take up the energy that we have for today. The scripture again says, seek his kingdom and righteousness first. When we start to do that, I believe that he will strip the worries away and replace it with a peace that you need, a peace that can't be stripped away, a peace that can't be stolen from you. I hope that spoke to you this morning. And I know that this could be easier said than done. But as Christ said, let's just concern ourselves with today. Make today the best that we can. Let tomorrow happen. Have faith that you'll make it through today. With that, it's never goodbye. It's always see you later. Have an amazing week.